for today's event. Today we get to hang out with Justine Amendolia. Justine is a marine biologist, plastic pollution researcher, and science communicator based out of St. John's, Newfoundland here in Canada. In 2014, she was awarded the National Geographic Young Explorer Grant to travel to Eastern Greenland to research Arctic seabirds and live in an off-grid hunting cabin for six weeks. So Justine works as a garbage detective researching the plastic landscapes of the southern coastlines of Newfoundland through shoreline marine debris surveys and working at sea with local fishers. Uh, she attempts to understand the presence, movement, and potential for harm caused by plastic pollution in the waters around Newfoundland. So Justine, we just had you for an event uh, a few months ago and you must have had a good time because we've got you back already. Uh, we're excited to introduce you to a new group of students, learn a little bit more about what you do, and then we'll let the students go to town with some questions. Perfect. Hi everyone. So thank you so much for inviting me in your classes today. Um, I'm really, really excited to talk to you. So for the first part, I'm going to present a presentation about my career and life as a marine biologist. So, and then after that, we'll do questions. But we'll do start from the start. So as Joe mentioned, uh, my name, oh, sorry about that. One second. Yep. So as Joe mentioned, my name is Justina Mandalia and you know, every It because I always loved going to the ocean and it really allowed me to kind of grab my dream and make this a full-time job. Um, so I know that most of you you guys, are, the job list is the last on your radar. So I'm hoping to kind of open your mind with, you know, potential job. As a marine biologist, I study animals that are associated with the ocean. So I've studied birds. I've really become interested in garbage and plastic pollution. I'm sure most of you have heard about gar garbage in the ocean being a really big issue. And as a biologist studying animals, um, it's really, it goes hand in hand to study this problem because garbage affects everyone who lives in the ocean and it's becoming a really So for today's talk, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna discuss where I grew up, how I got into the ocean, and eventually my first path that led me to the big issue of so I grew up in uh, Toronto, Canada. You know, it's Canada's largest city, and it's, it has about six million people right now. And you can see it's pretty far from any oceans. Uh, we're surrounded by uh, a lot of freshwater lakes. But I always got the question growing up: Is how do you chance to see it on a day? My family and I would go down. Justine, can I pause you for just a moment? Yeah. You're something kind of sounding a little funny with the microphone. Is there something on top of it or running over it? Uh, no, can you hear me now? Yeah, we kind of get you for like a good like 30 seconds and it almost sounds like muffled, like something smothering oh, it. That's, that's strange, okay. Um, what about now, Joe? Okay, let's try and roll and see if it cooperates with us. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Yep, yeah, so um, growing up, I was really lucky in that I got to go to Florida every year. And, you know, when I was about six years old, my family handed me a pair of goggles and almost immediately I threw myself underneath the water. And it was my first time seeing the fish at my feet and, you know, swimming amongst the rocks. And I got really, really excited as a kid. And I started thinking about all these questions. How do animals exist in nature? How do they interact with each other? And you know, at the time, they seemed like really simple questions, but th these are the kind of um, thoughts that you know marine biologists have to think about on a daily basis. So I kind of held on to that passion. And you know, as I grew up, um, I found other ways to kind of throw myself into the water and <laughs> not want to leave. And essentially, I ended up going, after I went through elementary school and high school, I managed to go to university um, where I got the opportunity to go down to the Caribbean to study corals. And you can see me here diving into this massive coral reef. And one of the biggest highlights of this experience was feeling really, really tiny because you can see that surrounding me is a, there are a whole bunch of animals there and, you know, having the chance to be completely surrounded by nature and go out into the ocean and ask these really awesome questions in biology was really, really inspiring. So I held on to that passion, but I realized at the time that, you know, as much as I liked the warm climate, I really wanted to do marine biology in Canada or if anything, a Northern environment. So when I went to university, like how you guys are listening to me talk now, I heard a speaker, um, 
talk about her experience up in the Arctic. And this is almost like the equivalent of your teacher. Um, this is Dr. Shoshana Jacobs, and she was my teacher at the time, um, who was talking about her experience up in the Arctic studying seabirds. And after listening to her speak, I got really excited about this whole idea of birds living in the Arctic and how they interact with the ocean. So after I listened to her talk, I asked her if she could ship me off to the Arctic to go and study uh, bio biology like she did. So what ended up happening was we picked us a, a location. So if you haven't seen Greenland before, it's a one of the largest islands in the world um, in the Arctic, and it is absolutely beautiful to study seabirds. So we made a project and I ended up getting shipped off to this beautiful place called Cap Hogue, Eastern Greenland. And you can see in the corner there, all the birds. This is home to about 2 million seabirds. Um, so it's a really, really important area for these birds to live during the summer. But you can see it's pretty far off from any big city. Um, so you actually have to charter a helicopter to get there. And you can see me over there. And it was really exciting for me because I was kind of thrown into this world of planning uh, expedition logistics. So, you know, when you see people on TV go up to really remote places and they have to go to really extreme measures, um, I got a taste of that world. So when we lived in this uh, bird colony, you know, where the, bir the bird's home was, uh, we were about 300 feet below them. So you can see our home in the circle there is actually a tiny, tiny cabin. And it's uh, it had no electricity or running water or any of that. And, you know, we would have to hike up every morning to see the birds by about 300 feet. So if you can imagine waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning and going up for a hike, that's basically how our day was with the research. Now our cabin, again, no electricity, no running water. And for someone like myself from a big city who's never lived like this for six weeks straight, um, it was a really eye-opening experience. We also had to eat um, a lot of canned foods. So if you can picture canned fish and crackers, um, that was basically our diet for a few weeks. Um, and also we had to take ice from the ocean and melt it uh, for our drinking water. And actually during this period, we couldn't even take baths because like we, like I said, there's no showers there. Um, one of my favorite parts was actually the wash, the toilets and the washrooms there. If you can see the toilet was actually outside of our cabin and it had the best view in the house. And if you can picture this when you're out in the out in this um, location, there's only three people around you, but you're more likely to run into a polar bear than you are other people. So the birds I studied uh, were called little ox and they look like miniature penguins and they're about the size of a can of coke and they're super awesome birds to study because when they come to land you get to interact with them and hold them and uh, do basically find more out, out about their lives. So my project was pretty simple. It was to grab these birds and put little backpacks on them and these backpacks were electronic and what they would do is um, they would take information about where the birds were flying. So I, my question was to see where are the birds getting their food in the ocean? Because as you can imagine, we didn't have a ship with us and I couldn't follow the birds on a boat. Um, so the easiest way for biologists to answer these questions are to put these little trackers on them. Now, the problem with my project was I got all the trackers on the birds, but I couldn't get them off because the trackers fell in the ocean. And I, I panicked at this point because I thought, oh my gosh, my project's gone and I'm never gonna be able to finish it. But, you know, as a biologist, you really have to learn how to think on your feet, uh, even when things go really wrong. So my logical suggestion or my logical um, solution for this was actually not to study the track tracker or the tracks of the birds because they lost them all, but instead to study their poop. Um, so you can see here, those little containers are actually filled with uh, samples of bird poop and my whole goal was to basically study what the birds were eating. Um, and you can do this by looking at um, their different poop. So, you know, this experience as a whole was really eye opening. Uh, not only did it teach me how to become a problem solver and learn how to make the best of a bad situation, but it also opened up my eyes to how beautiful our environment and nature could be. Um, having this experience, like this was my office view for six weeks and I was really lucky to be one of the only people in the world who's been up to this location. Um, and for me, I was really passionate afterwards about conservation. So it really uh, shocked me when I got back home and I found out that the birds in this picture were actually eating plastic in the ocean. And I'm sure most of you have heard about, you know, garbage being a really big issue now. And you can see from this picture that it 
this is supposed to be an iceberg. It looks like a chunk of ice in the Arctic, but instead what it is, it's a, a shopping bag. And it just goes to show, you know, how common um, this issue is around the world and how humans are kind of creating this massive problem. Now, the thing with plastic pollution is a lot of it is big, like the shopping bags. But the majority of what we find in the oceans is actually they're super tiny pieces of plastic. So microplastics are smaller than the size of a grain of rice. And what's really tricky about um, this problem is, is that really when big plastics break up, they create these tiny pieces. But then you have a whole bunch of different types. They come in different shapes, sizes, materials, chemistries. They have different toxins associated with them. So the issue gets really complicated. So now, ever since learning about this issue, I've become a bit of a garbage detective. I'm really interested in going to beaches and seeing what kind of plastic is on the beach and where is it coming from? You know, what are the sources? Um, are they, is plastic coming from um, close by places or is it coming from far away places uh, by ocean currents? And, you know, it's been a really interesting job so far. So I live right now on an island on the east coast of Canada called Newfoundland, and it's the furthest out east you can get. Now, with my job, I work with the Placentia Bay Ocean Debris Survey Team, and what we do is we visit this, like, we go and do garbage detective work on the same beaches over and over every month. And you can see, like, this is an example of what it is during the summer, but this is winter. Uh, it's a, a typical Canadian image, lots of snow, lots of ice, very high winds. And, you know, it's not always a ple pleasure to work in, but it's really important to understand how plastic exists in the environment at all times of the year. So I actually um, hit the beach with three other colleagues that I work very closely with. And we basically strike poses like this and look for big pieces of garbage, small pieces, medium sizes. And what we're trying to do is, again, map out um, what plastic pollution looks like in the environment. But if you look at um, the scene behind us, there's a whole bunch of houses. So even though I was working in a very remote place in Greenland where no one lived, um, in this picture here, I'm working in people's backyards. And the thing is, is that, you know, as a scientist, you don't always have the answers um, with regards to what garbage you're finding. And actually talking to people who aren't scientists can offer a lot of information. So with our work, um, I'm quite lucky in that we get to do community beach cleanups where we get community members involved and they're actually telling us really important information because at the end of the day, even if you're not a scientist and you're looking out into nature and you can see trends and patterns, you have as valuable knowledge as us on the science side do. So some examples of the garbage that we find this is a Tide bottle, so it's um, laundry detergent that your parents use to clean clothes. And you can see it's all burnt up and it looks really chewed out. And this is what happens in communities where garbage disposal facilities aren't close by. So there's no garbage trucks that come by certain people's houses because they're pretty far from cities. And at the end of the day, people have no choice but to burn garbage, which is really sad because a lot of the times people think they're getting rid of their garbage, but in fact, they're just becoming a different form. Now, another thing that we find is that really always kind of um, makes me laugh is plastic flowers. Um, every time I walk past these things on the beach, I always think they're real. And again, you can see the different types and shapes and colors. Um, so it just goes to show how far this plastic problem is that we're finding um, pieces that look like nature that are in fact plastic. But mostly what we find is fishing gear. Um, if you, I, I know there's a, a classroom from, from Connecticut, you might have seen this around. Um, this is a, called a buoy. It's what they fishermen use to uh, basically put on the side of their boats and also mark their traps. And it's a really big piece of plastic. But what we do find a lot of is the rope. So you can see all these little threads are coming off uh, the big piece of rope. And this actually happens when the rope's exposed to a lot of sun and wind and it starts to break apart and crumble. Um, it was really exciting when we were able to look at these microplastics, these really small pieces of plastic and make that connection as to where they were coming from. Because a lot of the times when you find plastic that's really tiny, it's hard to understand the origins or you know what they, it was actually a part of at one point. So now when we do our science, we try to integrate citizen science technologies. And that means anyone who's not a formal scientist, who doesn't have the training, 
that means they can do science as much as well as we can. Um, the app that we have on our phone is called Marine Debris Tracker, and it's free to download and anyone in the world can use it. And what's wonderful about it is that when we pick up garbage, we log everything with this app. And what it tells us, or what, what it does is all this information goes to a global database. So anyone in the world can access this information and learn more about the garbage in their backyards. And you can use it if you're in a city, if you live by the ocean like me, or if you live, you know, um, by a lake. So now we also um, use do-it-yourself technologies. And that means that um, anyone who wants to build some of the scientific tools can. Um, what you see is a little net in the water that was um, uh, developed by one of our colleagues and the trawl is called uh, the low-tech aquatic debris instrument. And instead of spending thousands of dollars on a high-tech science uh, model, you can actually you know, build this yourself for a couple hundred dollars, which is pretty cool. And that basically allows us to collect all the different types of plastic in the water and see what's going on. Uh, we also work really close with locals, like I said. Uh, when we go out at sea, we actually go on fishing boats. And the fish, the fishermen are really helpful with helping us pick our scientific locations because, again, they know their backyard way better than we do. So they offer really, really good information, and it's great working with them. Another way that we look at plastic in the environment that I've done with other projects um, is actually going on fishing boats and collecting fish. Um, you know, fish sometimes eat plastic and it's really important to understand what's going on in uh, these big food webs and seeing how plastic can work its way into different animals. So you can see from these pictures here, uh, it's a lot of fish guts. And it's not the cleanest job, um, or it's, it actually gets quite smelly at times, but it's actually really interesting once you start to look inside of animals and see how this material works its way up into food webs. So that being said, marine biology is a really awesome field uh, to get into. And it hasn't been, you know, I've really taken a lot of different roads that I never thought were available. And yeah, studying life choices so far because it's such a big issue that we can all contribute to in our own way in terms of solving it. So if anyone has any questions, I would love to hear them. And thank you so much for listening.